Chapter one, history of medicine and pharmacy. We'll skip over the terms and definitions as we'll cover them throughout the chapter. We do have also a list of important people in this chapter. We'll skip over them. We'll talk about them in the chapter as well. Medicine has been practiced for thousands of years. Archaeological discoveries have unearthed civilizations that have documented the use of minerals, animals, and plant parts to heal the sick. Certain remedies, such as herbs, have been used consistently throughout history. For example, herbs have been used for centuries for minor ailments, such as intestinal problems, arthritis, and gout. Many ancient treatments for illness were based on the dreams or visions of the believers. A dogma, such as God's being able to both cause and cure illnesses, is based on a set of principles proposed by authoritarians. These principles are based on writings from respected spiritual authorities rather than scientific evidence. One belief about healing the sick was that severe illness was caused by evil spirits. To rid a person of an evil spirit, a cut was made into the skull to give the spirit a portal through which to leave. This type of treatment was called trifening and often was performed by a tribal shaman, a spiritual person in a tribe who cares for the spiritual, medicinal, and physical health of the tribe. Tribal shamans were believed to have the gift of being able to communicate with spirits. Other shamans believe that they were connected with a special spirit who helped them render the evil spirits harmless through the use of prayer, herbs, and potions. Shamans were prevalent through society in ancient times. Some still exist in various societies through the world. In North America, various Eskimo Native American tribes held shamans in high esteem. However, many popular beliefs of the past have mostly disappeared. The staff of Asclepius is a wingless walking stick with a single serpent wrapped around it. Because snakes shed their skin, the snake was believed to signify a renewal of youth. The caduceus is often mistakenly used as a symbol of medicine. The caduceus is the staff of Hermes, a Greek god. The staff represented magic and had two serpents wrapped around it, it usually with two wings at the top. For example, in 1902, the U.S. Army erroneously adopted the caduceus as an emblem of the medical corps, leading to its mistaken use as a symbol of medicine. Although many organizations still use the caduceus to represent medicine, the true staff of Asclepius has been adopted as a symbol by authoritative health organizations such as the World Health Organization and the American Medical Association. So, A, this is the caduceus, and B is the Army Medical Corps. Um, Early path of medicine was not a smooth road. Throughout the ages, many plagues killed thousands of people. The existence of microbes unseen by the eye was not known to be responsible for many of the diseases that caused death and despair. Despite advances made through early history, most remedies for physical ailments tend to be extreme. Other ancient remedies have been used for hundreds of years. Prevalent thoughts included the belief that sickness was an entity within the body that needed a means to leave the body. Another widely held belief was that spirits were responsible for illness. In many cultures, the most common form of treatment, prayer, has remained the only way to cure illness. Hippocrates, born on a small island of Kos near Greece, was a third-generation physician. He taught at a school of medicine, which was one of the first medical schools established. He believed in the prevailing concept of that era. Life consisted of a balance of four elements that were linked to the qualities of good health. These four qualities were wet, dry, hot, and cold. In addition, he believed the illness that regulated from an imbalance of the four humors of the body system. Blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. These four humors were linked to the four basic elements. Blood is air, phlegm is water, yellow bile is fire, and black bile is earth. Methods used to treat imbalance of the humor included bloodletting and natural laxatives. Hippocrates was responsible for many advances in the world of medicine. Some of his observations included the effects of food, climate, and other influences on illness. He was one of the first physicians to record his patients' medical illnesses. This new way of viewing the cause of illnesses eventually led to the belief that sickness originated from something other than the supernatural. 
Hippocrates believed that the spirit of the patient was just as important as the condition being treated, and he promoted kindness to the sick. He also believed in letting nature do the healing and promoted resting and eating light foods. He taught that doctors need to rebalance the four humors. Most of his teachings have been documented in a collection of books called the Corpus Hippocraticum. Although many of the writings are now thought to be from different authors, they still reflect the teachings of Hippocrates. Today's medical schools still use the Hippocratic Oath as part of their graduation ceremony. Box 1.1 presents the revised version of the Hippocratic Oath used today. The Hippocratic Oath outlines the physician's responsibility to the patient. Hippocrates practiced what he preached with respect to exercise, rest, diet, and overall moderation and lifestyle. Various records have documented his death as occurring in 377 BCE, whereas other records record his death as having occurred in 357 BCE. Because of the advances he promoted in the world of medicine, it is not surprising that Hippocrates is known as the father of medicine. Before the existence of Hippocrates and other innovative scientists, people believe that they were at the mercy of the gods or supernatural forces. We have the Hippocratic Oath in Box 1.1. Later in history, the Greek philosopher and scientist Aristotle was responsible for many advances in the areas of biology and medicine. His main area of interest was biology and the study of classifications of various organisms. He classified human beings as animals because the Grecian belief system in those times did not allow dissection of the... He described much of human anatomy from observations he made from dissections of other animals. This included in-depth descriptions of the brain, heart, lungs, and blood vessels. Claudius Gallen began to study medicine at the age of 16. He attended medical schools in Greece and the famous Alexandria School of Medicine in Egypt. He later resided in Rome and was the personal physician of the Roman imperial family. Although he was born nearly 600 years after Hippocrates, he followed many of the same beliefs, such as eating a balanced diet, exercising, and practicing good hygiene. He contributed greatly to the study of medicine, writing more than 100 books on topics such as physiology, anatomy, pathology, diagnosis, and pharmacology. Many of his books were used in medical school for 1,500 years. He proved that blood rather than air flowed through arteries. Philosopher and alchemist Roger Bacon further refined and explained the importance of experimental methods which focus on observations, hypothesis, experimentation, and verification. During Bacon's time, most explanations were based on traditions, not fact. He preferred to rely on mathematics and measurement to prove his theories. He is considered an important contributor to what is now known as the scientific method. Paracelsus, a Swiss physician and alchemist, believed that it was important to treat illness with one medication at a time. At the end of the Middle Ages, it was a common practice to give multiple remedies or large quantities of agents that had not been tested previously. Through experimentation and documentation of the effectiveness and dose of each individual agent, Paracelsus was able to produce many medications. He introduced one of the most popular tonics of that time, lanum, which was used to deaden pain. Table 1.1 lists major figures and their influences throughout medical history. So one here. This might show up on E. Test or homework, quicker homework. So Louis Pasteur established the gem theory of disease. Felix Hoffman develops aspirin in 1899. Sir Alexander Fleming discovers penicillin. Gerhard Dogamak discovers sulfonamides. And we have all the way until 
pretty recently up to 2018. So we have Cardia Mobile. I'm sure some of you heard of. Over the millennia, some prevalent treatments consisted of mi multiple mixtures of plants, roots, and other concoctions. Digestion of the type of plant that resembled the organ affected by disease also was believed to cure illnesses. For example, those who lived with liver problems ingested a plant. For example, those with liver problems ingested a plant called liverwort. Name because the leaves were shaped like a liver. Other popular treatments included using garlic for inflammation of the bronchial tubes, wine and pepper for various stomach ailments, onions for worms, and tiger fat for joint pain. It was difficult to detect which of any of the ingredients administered actually worked because many concoctions contain a multitude of ingredients. As strange as many of those archaic remedies seem, there are people who were cured because of their strong belief in the treatment given or their belief in the person treating them. Throughout history, popular religious beliefs revolved around the idea that evil spirits were the cause of illness in a person who had sinned. This belief may have persisted partly because no one had the slightest idea about germs or genetics. Many times through trial and error, they are sometimes causing death, certain treatments were found to be fairly effective. Anytime new theories are proposed, they can be met with some skepticism and disbelief. Eventually, medicine and science discover methods to answer this need for corroboration, including to modern approaches and effective treatments for diseases. A new hypothesis should be treated as a possible answer that has not been disproved. As new sciences emerge and new methods are devised to test hypotheses, the results can lead to medical advances. This was especially evident throughout the golden age of microbiology. From the time of Galen, it was widely believed that the four humors could be rebalanced through the use of cathartics to clean out the bowels, diuretics to lessen the imbalance of body fluids, emetics to empty the stomach, and bloodletting to lessen body fluids, heart rate, and temperature. Physicians brought this theory to America where such techniques are widely used, especially bloodletting. Bloodletting had its origins in Egypt more than 3,000 years ago and later spread into all areas of Europe through the Middle Ages. Just as trephination of the skull was believed to release evil spirits, bloodletting was thought to be an effective way of lessening excess body fluids that were believed to cause illness. Artifacts such as sharp bones, shark's teeth, thorns, and sharpened sticks were thought to be the earliest instruments used in bloodletting. During the 19th century, some even used bloodletting as preventative medicine to ensure good health. A well-known victim of bloodletting in the United States during the 18th century was George Washington, who suffered from an infection and died of complications from bloodletting. At that time, it was wrongly believed that the body contained 12 quarts of blood. However, it contains only six quarts, and President Washington was bled of four quarts over a 24-hour period. One bloodletting treatment involved using leeches. These blood-sucking worms are gathered, stored, and used to remove blood from patients. The leech has the ability to latch onto the skin with sharp teeth-like appendages and engorge itself to nearly twice its size on a person's blood. Leeches also emit a natural anticoagulant, pyridin, that allows the blood to flow freely. Leeches were used in specific places such as the vagina to treat menorrhea. Once the leeches were finished eating, they would normally detach themselves. If not, they were encouraged to detach with the use of salt. Bleeding would continue until it was necessary to manually stop the flow of blood with bandages. Today, leeches are used in microsurgery and plastic surgery to prevent blood clots. Another form of bloodletting, venesection, was widely used in the 1700s and 1800s for those who did not want leeches applied. The physicians would heat the air inside a small cup and place it on the skin, which would draw up the skin tissue along with its blood flow. At this point, a lancet would be used to cut into the skin. The cup would be removed and one to four ounces of blood would be collected. Many patients succumbed to this procedure until the early 1900s when this type of treatment was declared quackery. Fortunately, medicine did advance through the 19th century in many ways. Medical schools arose throughout Europe, especially in France and Germany. 
Many of the doctors trained in these schools came to the United States and brought with them this European influence in medicine. Medicinal recipes were written in Latin until the 1900s. Table 1.2 presents an example of a commonly compounded prescription. Because Latin was used in medicine and apothecary products, this order could be interpreted by most practitioners. Although there have been many changes in the accepted abbreviations and weights in medicine, the fluid ounce can still be seen on pharmacy bottles. Several important medical advances that have changed medical treatments and lengthened the human lifespan are listed in Table 1.1. Well, this is the example of the prescription. So throughout the 19th century, the church became active in scientific research as well. A monk named Gregor Mendel experimented on plants and noticed the changes from generation to generation with respect to color, size, and appearance. He used pea plants to determine how traits were transferred from one to another, and in doing so, determined the basis of genetics. In 1822, he determined how stronger plants could be propagated through heredity. It was not until the 1900s, however, that other scientists were able to continue his work and enlighten the scientific world with the theory of genetics. As a result of his work, Mendel became known as the father of genetics. Florence Nightingale was born in Florence, Italy in 1820 and is best known as a nurse who spent her career caring for the wounded. She believed in cleanliness and its benefits to the medical field. She started a hospital and founded a school for nurses. Her writing sparked worldwide health care reform. In early North America, as new immigrants brought their families from Europe and other parts of the world, disease followed. At that time, doctors were responsible not only for diagnosing conditions, but also for preparing the necessary remedies to cure patients. Disease was widespread in the colonies, and many people did not survive the voyage across the sea from Europe, succumbing to diseases such as scurvy and severe intestinal infections. Patients were at a disadvantage, though, throughout the colonies because there were few doctors and even fewer hospitals. First pharmacists, known as druggists at the time, were doctors until pharmacy became a specialty. The term druggist was widely used from the 1700s until the mid-1800s to describe the practitioners of pharmacy, eventually leading to the title pharmacist. Remedies used in early American history included kinchona bark, quinine, for the treatment of malaria. More unconventional and dangerous treatments also were used. For example, mercury was used to treat syphilis. Many people died of mercury poisoning because of its toxicity. Many people also died of typhoid fever, malaria, diphtheria, and dysentery. The need for doctors and treatments increased dramatically. The average life expectancy was approximately 40 years, and many families lost children to childhood diseases such as smallpox, for which no vaccines were available. Most treatments were concoctions handed down throughout family tradition. If a person were to use a doctor, he or she most likely would be treated at home or in the doctor's office with treatments ranging from minor procedures to surgeries. Table 1.3 represents some typical remedies used in the 1800s in the United States. So to blow, blow tobacco smoke into the ear to stop earache. For worms, take a tablespoon of molasses and mix it with tin rust and ingest. So there's just some of those there. One of the most popular tonics made for medicinal use in the early United States contained opium and alcohol. Its effectiveness was surpassed only by its addictiveness. This tonic was given as a sedative and to dull the sensation of pain. Paracelsus introduced the opium alcohol mixture called laudanum in the 16th century, and laudanum was used as a medical remedy. It was used widely throughout Europe in the Victorian era. During the Civil War, laudanum not only was used to treat painful wounds from the battlefield, but also found its way into households throughout the United States for less severe problems. Laudanum was used mostly by white, middle-class, upper-class women for a host of problems, including nervousness, diabetes, diarrhea, gastric problems, menstrual pain, and even morning sickness. 
Laudanum was also used to calm screaming babies. Individuals became addicted at an alarming rate. Many mortalities and miscarriages were attributed to this agent. Even though it was well known by the 18th century that opium and alcohol were addictive, alternative remedies were hard to find. Box 1.3 presents an example of a laudanum recipe from 1669 that was used as a remedy for dysentery. Another alcohol-based liquid was absinthe. A herb, Artemisia absinthium, was mixed with alcohol and other additives. Absinthe was served with water and sugar and was purported to rid a person of tapeworms, among many other ailments. Here's that laudanum recipe from 1669. Opium has a long history for medicinal release of, of pain and recreational use. Opium is a byproduct of the plant commonly known as the opium poppy. The sap is taken from the head of the poppy. The raw opium is then precipitated from the sac. The result of this process is a potent drug that causes an analgesic effect. Although opiate was a term used for a drug derived from opium, the most common term is opioid, which refers to both synthetic and semi-synthetic medications. Opiates and opioids react on the same opioid receptor sites, which are located in the central nervous system and gastrointestinal tract. The effects associated with the opium receptors included analgesia, respiratory depression, pupil constriction, reduced gastrointestinal motility, euphoria, dysphoria, sedation, and physical dependence. Opioids and opiates have many of the same side effects, including nausea and vomiting. When used properly, the opioid drugs are effective and help many patients who otherwise would suffer extreme pain. Not until 1909, under the Opium Exclusion Act, did the prohibition of opium importation begin in the United States, except for medicinal purposes. In the 1900s, many new medicines were discovered. Some of the earlier groundbreaking discoveries were for medicines that were useful in treating infections. The Scottish physician and bacteriologist Alexander Fleming accidentally contaminated a plate of bacteria with mold while working in his laboratory in 1928. The mold inhibited the growth of the bacteria, and he named the mold penicillin. Many years of failed and successful experimentation by many scientists followed before penicillin was recognized as a useful medicine. It was not until after 1938 that penicillin would undergo mass production and be used worldwide as a helpful antibiotic. Penicillin was the first antibiotic discovered and is still in use today. The first synthetic drug, a sulfonamide, was discovered by Gerhard Domagok in 1938 and was derived from a chemical dye found to inhibit bacterial growth. This sulfonamide was used extensively during World War II to treat infections that were a result of battle wounds. Today, sulfonamides are primarily used to treat urinary tract infections. Many antibiotics were discovered in the years after penicillin and sulfa. In the 20th century, Rosalind Franklin, a British scientist, discovered the density and helical shape of DNA. Her work would lay the foundation for another particularly important discovery made by James Watson and Francis Crick. In April 1953, they published a scientific paper presenting the structure of the DNA double helix, the molecule that carries genetic information from one generation to another. In 1962, Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, along with Maurice Wilkins, for their important contributions to science. Many of the most famous chemists, biologists, and doctors who contributed to science were from European countries such as Germany, England, France, and Poland. Louis Pasteur, who is best known for the pasteurization process, was also responsible for discovering vaccines such as the anthrax vaccine. Table 1.4 provides a list of pathogens and diseases that were discovered along with the vaccines administered to prevent these diseases. So we have examples of important vaccine advances in medicine. And kind of interesting to go to the recent ones. We go up to 2019 here. So 
we don't have COVID or anything like that um, yet on, on this book since it was published before them. Many archaic treatments fell out of favor during the middle to late 19th century, yet certain ones prevail. For instance, patients are bled daily in all types of medical settings. For example, if a physician orders a blood test to be done on a patient, up to 30 ml of blood will be taken from the patient's vein. This, of course, is used to diagnose an illness rather than as a curative measure. Yet these techniques originated in the distant past, and today no one would question such a technique. The disorder hemochromatosis Hemochromatosis is a hereditary condition in which the body absorbs too much iron, which is stored in organs and can cause serious damage. The current treatment for this disorder is to remove blood on a regular basis. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, was approved the use of both leeches and maggots in the medical setting in 1976. This may seem strange and not much of an advance in medicine, our origins of this type of treatment stem from research and the repair of tissue that has been severely damaged, such as that found in patients who have undergone reconstructive surgery or skin grafts or patients with infections. Surgical reattachment of veins can result in coagulation before blood flow is reestablished to the affected part, thus killing the affected tissues. Leeches are used to siphon excess blood from the area and prevent coagulation from taking place too soon. They are applied one at a time over 20 minutes for up to two days as necessary. Leeches are cared for and stored in the refrigerator and the pharmacy. They may not be the first choice of a physician, but they have been used in many cases successfully as a means of avoiding amputation. Because dead skin is the main dietary intake of magnets, they can be used to remove dead skin. Antibiotics are normally used as the first course of treatment. However, when they are ineffective, physicians have used maggots to do the manual work of restoring the wound to a recoverable stage. Maggots not only eat the dead tissue, they also have the ability to kill the bacteria that are the cause of the infection. Treatments involving both leeches and maggots are very inexpensive compared with other treatments. Other remedies are being studied, such as the honey produced by some bees. The medicinal attributes of this type of honey include the ability to heal wounds. Manuka honey keeps the wound moist, is bacteria-free, and has a high sugar content, along with minerals, vitamins, and amino acids that may promote healing. In 2007, the FDA and Health Canada approved its use for wounds and burns. In 2010, it was approved to treat leg ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers. In 2012, the FDA approved Manuka honey wound dressings to be sold over the counter to treat abrasions, lacerations, and minor cuts. As medicine advances, it is wise not to forget the past because many historical treatments and remedies may be the answer for future cures. Pharmacy plays a part in both the historical and future advances in medicine and treatments because the roots of medicinal knowledge run deep. The expanding population and the subsequent increasing need for trained medical personnel influence the need for specialists such as veterinarians, eye doctors, and pharmacists. In addition, the shipping of medicines to America from England was becoming difficult as the colonies separated from England. After the Civil War, apothecaries, which are pharmacies, began to emerge in towns across America. Manufacturing plants were built and people were trained to prepare medications accurately. As a physician's role changed from distributing drugs to diagnosing disease and performing surgery, the role of the pharmacist emerged. The first pharmacy school opened in 1821 at the College of Pharmacy and Sciences in Philadelphia. The school is now called the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. Through the 1800s, pharmacists compounded nearly every drug ordered by physicians. Various sizes of ornate apothecary jars were used to store herbs and ingredients. The instructions for preparing remedies were contained in medical recipe books. Ingredients such as chalk for heartburn, rose petals for headaches, and oils, herbs, and spices filled containers in the apothecary. Although many of the ingredients and early compounded remedies are no longer used, several are still in use today, such as aspirin, digoxin, and others. Another type of interesting container associated with the pharmacy was the show globe. 
Bell globes have been the beacons for pharmacy dating back as far as the early 1600s. It is thought that they are placed in the apothecary stores of the town to let visitors know the status of the health of the town. Red meant there was illness or that the town was in quarantine because of disease, whereas green meant the town was healthy and thus it was safe to come into the town. It also said that signs are posted on the doors of contagious individuals rather than relying on the globes. Decorative globes show patrons the pharmacist's competencies in chemical mixtures. This was done using various liquids of differing densities causing a layered effect. These types of jars are now displayed in many pharmacies along with other artifacts from the past. So we got them right up here. Oops, it's blocking it. What I mean. The first pharmacy managed by a registered pharmacist opened in New Orleans in 1823. Starting in the mid 1800s and early 1900s, the soda fountain became an extension of the town drugstore. The first soda fountain pharmacy opened in the mid 1800s and they gained popularity in the early 1900s. Prohibition in 1919 also helped with the proliferation of soda fountains. With this invention by a pharmacist, Jacob Bauer, of a soda fountain that dispensed carbon dioxide, soda fountain units could easily prepare all types of carbonated drinks. Pharmacists would make and market their own recipes to be used for various treatments. It was common to find drugs mixed with flavorings along with effervescent soda water to treat ailments or provide a boost of energy. Both caffeine and cocaine were also often used in sodas. Some of the many conditions mineral water was supposed to cure was obesity, upset stomach, depression, and nervous disorders. Pharmacists sold phosphate sodas and ice cream favorites, worked the lunch counter, and filled the prescriptions for the day. The first 7-Up drink was made with lithium and was sold from soda fountains for conditions such as gout, uremia, and rheumatism. In 1886, Coca-Cola was invented by John Pemberton, a pharmacist in Georgia. The soft drink was marketed as a tonic and contained extracts of cocaine and caffeine until 1905, when cocaine was removed from the recipe because of changing public opinion regarding its use. It was not until later, after the Harrison Narcotic Drug Act of 1914, that pharmacists were prohibited from making cocaine-containing preparations and began to sell plain soda drinks. Table 1.5 presents a list of pharmacists and inventors. By the late 1800s, the soda shop pharmacy was so popular that people came to drink the sweet concoctions, whether they were ailing or not. This type of pharmacy setting undoubtedly added to the image of the friendly neighborhood pharmacist as a person who could be trusted. The stereotypic local neighborhood pharmacist who wore a white jacket, packaged medications, and sometimes worked the soda machine has all but disappeared, except in a few shops where a person may still purchase an old-fashioned malt or milkshake while waiting for a prescription to be filled. So we have table 1.5 that shows famous pharmacists. So we have a lot of pharmacists to thank for soda. So Charles Alderton invented Dr. Pepper. Kayla Bradham invented Pepsi. Cola. Charles Elmer Hires invented Hires Root Beer. John Pemberton invented Coca-Cola. Susan Hayhurst was the first woman to graduate from the Philadelphia School of Pharmacy. William Proctor Jr. was the father of American Pharmacy, founded American Pharmaceutical Associations in 1852. Isla Phillips Stewart was one of the first African-American female pharmacists in the United States. James Verners invented Verners Ginger Ale. The first pharmacy technicians were those who enlisted in the military because of the high demand for medications to treat injuries and illness. These individuals were trained on the job not only to fill prescriptions, but also to perform many of the functions of a pharmacist. To this day, military technicians have a broader scope of training than civilian technicians. Technicians also were employed by pharmacists who owned drugstores. Family members helped behind the counters, filled stock, and waited on customers. These early pharmacy clerks then moved on to become what we now call pharmacy technicians. And I just I think it's kind of cool because my aunt actually 
was a pharmacy technician before pharmacy technicians exist. She probably wouldn't even have called herself a pharmacy clerk. She worked at a pharmacy that um, was a full service pharmacy, but also they did like lotto. Um, they had a storefront, many other things. So I used to go and visit her there. So it's kind of interesting um, that those type of settings are kind of gone now. An urgent need for standardized training arose in the 1960s as a pharmacist organization, such as the American Society of Health System Pharmacies, so the ASHP, our accredited board, the Michigan Pharmacists Association, the MPA, and the American Pharmacists Association, the APHA, realized that technicians would be able to better serve the patient with additional training. Technicians play such an important role in the healthcare of patients that it is important for them to understand all aspects of the required tasks in the pharmacy. At the first conference on pharmacy technicians held by the ASHP in 1988, many of the topics involved pharmacy technician training. Although other aspects of the pharmacy setting, such as the lack of technician involvement in the workplace, were also discussed. In 1995, the Pharmacy Technician Certification Board was formed which was responsible for creating a national examination for technicians. Although the transition from clerk to technician is fairly recent in history, forecasts indicate that the pharmacy technician will play a critical role in the future pharmacy setting. New job positions are constantly being created for technicians who have the necessary skills and knowledge to fill them. So yes, there's a lot of non-traditional pharmacy roles that are now being offered and it's just amazing and awesome to see the way that you can take your career. Now. Clinical technicians now assist the pharmacist with a variety of tasks, such as anticoagulation monitoring. They also may manage the automation and pharmacy coordination systems in certain pharmacies. Table 1.6 presents an outline of the important chronological events that have transformed the position of a pharmacy technician into its current role. So back in started 1940, the origins of a training program for technicians are established by the U.S. military. And lots of important dates there. We're going up to probably 2019. Oh, we have a 2020. So in 2020, PTCB begins new eligibility requirements and began offering an updated PTCB examination. As of December 31st, 2019, the PTCB had certified more than 706,000 technicians nationwide. This demonstrates the seriousness of this profession and the need for standardized competencies in the workplace. Up until the PTCB examination was established, most technicians had a high school diploma, although it was not mandatory. Also, background checks were not done in every state. After the PTCB was established, not only were educational standards instituted, but also salaries were increased for many certified technicians. Attitudes have changed over time as well. Technicians once were viewed as incompetent in many areas of pharmacy, but nonetheless a threat to replace pharmacists with cheap labor. Views now have changed because even with the increase of technicians in the workplace, pharmacists still are in high demand. Technicians are now a part of the healthcare team, and most pharmacists are confident they can delegate tasks to technicians, knowing that the job will be done correctly. It is no coincidence that as higher standards and educational requirements have been set for pharmacy technicians, pharmacist trust in technicians has increased. Times have changed, so have the requirements of today's pharmacists. For licensure, most states now require a new pharmacist to obtain a doctor of pharmacy degree, a PharmD. College students can start a four-year pharmacy program after successfully completing two to four years of undergraduate coursework and earning a passing score on the pharmacy college admissions test, the PCAP. Coursework usually includes biology, chemistry, anatomy, and physics. Additionally, PharmD students must complete rotations in a variety of clinical and pharmaceutical settings. Pharmacists who received a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy before this change have been allowed to work in pharmacy without obtaining a Doctor of Pharmacy degree. 
Pharmacist licensure also requires examination through the National Associations of Boards of Pharmacy, in addition to examination according to the state's pharmacy laws. Candidates for licensure must demonstrate competency by passing these examinations. Today's a pharmacist also needs in-depth and broad communication skills to communicate effectively with doctors, other healthcare team members, and patients. Today's typical pharmacy technician is required to do an array of tasks, all of which require competencies in many areas. Therefore, in some states, technicians are required to complete additional education and national certification. Currently, there are no nationally standardized requirements for pharmacy technicians. Technicians assist the pharmacists in community settings by entering and maintaining patient medications and history, preparing prescriptions, management of inventory and third-party billing, and compounding specialized medications. In an institutional setting, which includes hospital and other types of inpatient pharmacies, tasks include supplying floor stock, preparing parental medications, transcribing physician's orders, and managing inventory for automated dispensing cabinets. Their practice areas, such as long-term care, nuclear medicine facilities, and insurance or call centers, require technicians to be trained in specialty areas. In all pharmacy settings, technicians require strong communication and organizational skills. Entry-level pharmacy technicians must possess skills in pharmacology, laws, and regulations, compounding, medication safety, inventory, and billing and technology. They can also obtain specialty certifications and may participate in providing specialty services. In some cases, participation may be governed by state law, professional licensing boards, and certifying bodies. For example, some pharmacy technicians assist in anticoagulant or pharmacokinetics services, working under the supervision of a pharmacist to review patients' laboratory results and determine the drug concentration and its relation to the therapeutic response of the patient. Pharmacists will then write the necessary change in medication strength based on the laboratory results. Other specialty duties include, but are not limited to, oncology, pediatrics, geriatrics, and compounding services. New specialty certifications and opportunities for technicians also are available. PTCB began offering an advanced credential in some specialty certificates. Critical Point offers specialized training in sterile products and hazardous drug compounding. Many hospitals allow technicians to prepare chemotherapy drugs and offer advanced positions as medication reconciliation technicians. Over the decades, the pharmacist has become known as a person who can be trusted to provide truthful information, someone in whom a person can be comfortable confiding. Although some traditions continue, times have changed concerning the role of the pharmacist. The most prevalent can be seen in the inpatient setting of the hospital. As the competency of a pharmacist has become more clinical and involved in the patient's overall well-being and health, pharmacists are becoming more involved alongside physicians in the appropriate prescribing of medications and their dosages. These clinical pharmacists are found in the community pharmacy and hospital settings. Another important change in pharmacy concerns the laws governing patient consultation. The Omni Bus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990, over 90, addressed several issues concerning patient education and monitoring medications. Although initially consultation was required to be offered only to Medicaid patients, most states have developed statutes that require pharmacists to provide written and or oral consultation to all patients who are prescribed new or changed medications. Consultation is meant to inform and educate the patient about the medication he or she is taking. Because of these changes in the way pharmacies function, virtually every pharmacy employs pharmacy technicians. Thousands of technicians help lighten the load of filling prescriptions and performing other non-discretionary duties. Therefore, it is important for the patient to be able to trust a technician to provide the best care by filling the correct medication and referring the patient to the pharmacist for appropriate counseling. Most pharmacists agree that it is important for pharmacy technicians to maintain a standard of knowledge about pharmacy practice. Thus far, national certification is one of the best markers for ensuring a minimal level of competency in pharmacy.
Pharmacists have earned the trust of their patients over many decades, and it will take time for technicians to earn the same trust. This requires a true commitment to the profession of pharmacy on the part of the pharmacy technician. Through education, training, and good communication skills, technicians can gain the trust of the patients whom they serve. In the new millennium, with the roles of pharmacists and technicians becoming more clearly defined, new concerns arise. We must be aware that just as the advances of medicine through the ages met with much resistance, so has the profession of pharmacy. Changes in the role of pharmacists, technicians, and even clerks have met their share of obstacles, mostly from within the medical community. Some physicians are not eager to have pharmacists writing orders even if the medications are simple. Likewise, technicians have been perceived as posing a threat to pharmacy. Some pharmacists think that technician may take jobs away from pharmacists or may increase the pharmacist's liability if someone who is not properly trained makes a mistake. Therefore, there is disparity across the United States regarding the duties of a pharmacy technician. In some states, pharmacy technicians limit duties to a clerical level. In other states, technicians required to have training and or be certified as pharmacy technicians before they are employed. All technicians must be aware of the laws in their state. Each year, pharmacies are requiring a certain level of education from their technicians. This, in turn, allows for the expansion of job opportunities, and possibly higher pay for the technician. Technicians' duties continue to expand and change. In some pharmacies, technicians regularly enter new prescription orders into the computer. This task previously was done exclusively by a pharmacist. The pharmacist is moving into a more highly clinical role, not only counseling patients, but also working with the medical staff. To a degree, the technician now does what the traditional pharmacist did, a health professional who transcribed orders, pulled medications, and filled prescriptions. Advanced pharmacy technicians who have additional education may perform tasks that require more responsibility, and some organizations and colleges are offering specialized training programs for pharmacy technicians. Education and medication history, inventory management, quality improvement, immunizations, specialty compounding, and analysis are just a few of the specialty roles being offered for technicians. And do you remember these key points?